My name is Rick Renner, and today I'm in St. Petersburg, Russia, and I'm seated in front of the New Hermitage, a building filled with magnificent treasures. Oh, I love this place. And the treasures begin on the front porch. Look right behind me at these 10 statues of Atlas, each of them carved from beautiful Russian black granite, and each of them weighing 10 tons. And this is just the entryway to the building. When you actually get in the building, there's one room that is really special to me. It's called the 20 column room. It's a room that is designed like a Greek temple. It is magnificent. And the walls of that room are lined with cabinets filled with Greek earthenware and Greek vases that date all the way back to the 8th century BC. And of course, I can read ancient Greek, so I feel like I come alive in that room. But in the other building, in the Winter Palace, just right over there, is the Egyptian room. And when I'm in the Egyptian room, oh, it's like I step into the Bible. Because when we come to the book of Exodus, we read about Moses, the birth of Moses. In Exodus chapter 1, the call of God waking up in Moses in Exodus chapter 2, and finally Moses encountering God on Mount Horeb in Exodus chapter 3. My friend, this is not a fairy tale. This really happened. And when I'm here, I also think about places in Egypt where I've been like Karnak. Karnak stood during the time that Moses was alive. This magnificent temple right on the banks of the Nile River. Moses saw that. Today I'm going to talk to you about Moses and when he encountered God and saw the burning bush, what really happened there and how God wants to encounter you. It's going to be good. So stay with me today. Stay tuned for a teaching you can trust, a message that will inspire, strengthen, and equip you with vital insights and understanding from the Word of God. Here is Rick. Welcome to today's program. My name is Rick Renner, and as I told you in the introduction to today's program today, we're going to see Moses' experience with the burning bush on Mount Horeb. It's going to be powerful. But I want to tell you that if you need prayer, call us or send us an email. We would love to hear from you and put our faith together with you for whatever it is that's on your heart today. And if you're a partner, I want to say thank you for being a partner with our ministry. You're really making a difference in other people's lives. And if you're not a partner, please pray about becoming a partner with our ministry. You say, what's a partner? A partner is someone who regularly financially gives to our ministry to help us take this program to people all over the world. And people all over the world really are watching this program. Proverbs 10, 21 says, The lips of the righteous feed many. That's our job. We're to bring the solid teaching of the Bible into people's space all over the world. And when you're a partner with our ministry, you help us to do that. I want to say thank you if you're a partner. And if you're not, please join us as a partner to make a difference in someone else's life. And the moment you become a partner, we will send you Denise's book called The Gift of Forgiveness. And we'll send you my book, called Life in the Combat Zone. We always send these two books as our gift to those who become partners as our way of saying welcome to the partner family. And right now, we're offering you my brand new series called Moses and the Ten Plagues. It is just jam-packed with revelation and insights and information, and it comes with a study guide. The two of these together are so powerful, and you can get these right now by going to renner.org or you can give us a call. We're also offering you right now my book that is called How to Keep Your Head on Straight in a World Gone Crazy. Do you feel like the world around you has just gone berserk? It's gone crazy? Well, you can keep your head on straight even if you feel like you're in a world that's gone crazy. You need to know how to think right. You need to know how to keep your head on straight. 
You need to develop discernment for these last days. This book will be such a blessing to you. And we're also offering you my book called Last Days Survival Guide. The subhead says, a scriptural handbook to prepare you for these perilous times. The back of the book says, God wants you to be prepared for the last days. My friends, we're living in the very end of the age. And the Holy Spirit prophesied in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1 that at the end of the age, perilous times would come. We're living in those times. So we need to know how to navigate these waters. And that's why I wrote this book and I want you to have it. So order yours today. But hey, reach for your Bible. And today we're going to go back to Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3. We saw yesterday that Moses had been reared by his mother probably until the age of five. And at the age of five, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter. And it was Pharaoh's daughter who named him Moses. The reason she called him Moses is what we covered in yesterday's program. If you missed that, go back to the archives or order the series. You'll be amazed why she called him Moses. But for 40 years, he had lived in Egypt as a prince of Egypt. In fact, we're told by Josephus that he was in training to become the next Pharaoh of Egypt. But at the age of 40, the call of God began to be aroused inside him. And suddenly he had a desire to go visit his people, Israel, the Hebrews who were living in the land of Goshen and who were serving as slave labor at that particular moment in the land of Egypt. And when he was there, he did something remarkable. He killed an Egyptian who was troubling to Hebrews. Why did he do that? It must have shocked him. We know it shocked him because he took the dead man and hid him in the sand. Then he fled for his life. And when he got into the land of Midian, he saw a well and there were shepherds there troubling seven virgin girls who belonged to a man named Jethro. He didn't know those girls. He had never met those girls. But when he saw them being troubled by these shepherds, something in him rose up. He had to deliver those girls and he delivered them and chased away those shepherds. What was happening? The call of God was beginning to wake up inside Moses. He was beginning to feel the seeds of a deliverer inside him. He had to deliver those Hebrews that were being troubled by an Egyptian. Something in him had to deliver those girls that were being troubled by shepherds. But eventually, he came to Midian where he submitted himself to a man named Jethro. And this leads us to Exodus chapter 3, and verse 1, where the Bible says, Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. He married Zipporah, who was the daughter of this Jethro. And he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. By the time that we come to Exodus chapter 3, Moses has been living on the backside of the desert for 40 years. It has been 40 years since he left Egypt. And when we come to Exodus chapter 3 and verse 1, Moses is 80 years old. His past life in Egypt is a distant memory. He hardly remembers how to speak Egyptian because he hasn't spoken it freely for 40 years. And his life is now so humble, he doesn't even have a flock of sheep to call his own. He's keeping his father-in-law's sheep. But Moses was in a God-ordained school with a flock of sheep where God was teaching him how to deal with sheep because eventually he would lead the flock of God. And as he led those sheep on this particular day, he led them to Mount Horeb, which was very unusual because the locals believed that God lived on that mountain and they stayed away from it. But on this particular day, Moses led his flock to Mount Horeb. The word Horeb is kind of a mystery, but it seems that it describes a desert place or a place that is very desolate. It describes the terrain of that area. And when you come to verse 2, the Bible says, And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush, and he looked, and behold. The word behold carries the idea of awe, shock, amazement. He was awed by this. And behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. The angel of the Lord was in the fire and appeared to Moses 
And from the midst of the burning bush, God began to speak to Moses, and Moses was amazed that the bush did not burn. It burned, but it wasn't consumed. The bush burned with fire, but it didn't crackle, it didn't diminish, its leaves didn't curl, its branches did not burn. No branch was burned. The bush was not consumed, even though it was on fire. And this was such a magnetic sight that it caused Moses to draw near. Josephus tells us, but sometime afterward, he drove his flocks thither to feed them. Now this is the highest of all the mountains thereabouts, and the best of all pasturage and the herbage there was good. And it had not been before fed upon because of the opinion of men that God dwelled there. The shepherds not daring to ascend it. And here it was that a wonderful prodigy happened to Moses. And now we go back to Exodus 3, verse 3. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. Well, you have to remember that Moses was from Egypt. He had seen many great sights, but this sight was beyond anything he had ever seen at any moment in his life. It had a magnetic attraction upon Moses. He said, I will turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. Verse 4, and when the Lord saw that he turned aside, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And Moses answered, here am I. Wow. God called Moses by name, which means God had never forgotten Moses. God was waiting for this moment when Moses would turn aside. And when Moses said, here am I, suddenly Moses is at the altar of God. He is in a position where God can speak to him and give him an assignment for his life. And in verse 5, the Bible says that God said, draw not nigh thither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. God literally said, stop coming closer. Moses was on his way for a close-up examination of the bush. And secondly, God said, put off your shoes from your feet. Why? Because his shoes carried the contamination of the world and he was coming into a holy place. And in ancient times, and even today in many parts of the world, it is a custom that when you come into someone's house, you remove your shoes. That is a custom in Russia where I live. You don't walk through a person's house in your shoes because your shoes carry pollutions and the contamination of the world. You always remove your shoes. Well, on Mount Horeb, Moses had come into God's house. And now he was removing his shoes out of respect for the presence of God. He was removing pollutions from his feet and he was coming into God's house. Josephus tells us this, a fire fed upon a thorn bush. Yet did the green leaves and the flowers continue untouched and the fire did not at all consume the fruit branches, although the flame was great and fierce. Moses was frightened at this strange sight, but he was still more astonished when the fire uttered a voice and called to him by name and spake words to him, by which it signified to him how bold he had been in venturing to come into a place where no man had ever come before because the place was divine and advised him to remove a great way from the flame and to be contented of what he had seen. And though he were himself a good man and the offspring of great men, yet that he should not pry further. And he foretold to him that he should have glory and honor among men by the blessing of God upon him and commanded him to go away thence with confidence to Egypt in order to be the commander and conductor of the body of Hebrews and to deliver his own people from the injuries they had suffered there. That is what Josephus records about this event. But when you go back to Exodus chapter 3 and verse 6, the Bible continues to tell us that God said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And notice it says, Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Some may have thought in Egypt that God had forgotten his covenant with them 
But God had never forgotten his covenant. He said, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And notice Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look upon God. Why was he afraid to look upon God? Because Moses when he was growing up in Egypt, was being reared to be the next Pharaoh of Egypt. And as the next Pharaoh of Egypt, Moses himself was called a God and no one was allowed to look into the face of Moses because they believed that he was a God. If you served in Moses' court, you could not look in his face because it was believed that he was a God. And now Moses knows how to deal with a God. And he hides his face. He's afraid to look into the face of God. And in verse 7, the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people, which are in Egypt. I have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. And in this verse, God says, I have seen their affliction. I've heard their cries. I know their sorrows. And my friend, when you study the whole bulk of scripture, you find there are two things that God hears. Two things so terrible, so intense, it actually reaches God's ears in heaven. And the first is sin. We read this in Genesis chapter 18. God said, because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah and their sin is so great, I will come down to see whether they've done altogether according to the cry of it. God heard the cry of sin when it finally reached a maximum peak. And now we find in this verse, God hears the cries and the sorrows of his people. These are two things that God hears. He hears the cry of sin and God hears the cry of sorrow when it comes from the heart of his people. And in verse 8, God said, I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land unto a good land and a large land flowing with milk and honey unto the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. God's not just delivering them, but he's going to take them somewhere. And likewise, God wants to deliver you and then he wants to take you into a land flowing with milk and honey. And in verse 9, God said, Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come unto me, and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them. Verse 10, Come now, therefore, I will send thee unto Pharaoh, who possibly and probably was Tutmosis II, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. God says, I'm going to send you to bring about their deliverance. But if God is the one who is going to deliver them, why did he need Moses at all? And the answer is God uses human instruments. God really could have done it all by himself, but that's not the way that God works. God's plan is to work with and to work through people. We read this in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1, where Paul writes that we are workers together with God. God works through people. He's looking for someone to use today. God may be looking to you. But when you come to verse 11, Moses said unto God, who am I that I should go into Pharaoh? and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt. Forty years earlier, before he left Egypt, Moses knew exactly who he was. He was a prince of Egypt. We know from Acts chapter 7, he was mighty in words and deeds. We know from the writings of Josephus, he had been a military commander. But after 40 years of leading sheep around the desert, Moses had lost his ability to speak Egyptian. He had lost his self-confidence that he once had had. So in verse 12, God said, Certainly I will be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, you will serve God upon this mountain. But notice God says, Certainly I will be with thee. And that is God's promise to anyone that he sends on assignment. Verse 13, And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I'm coming to the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you, and they shall say unto me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? Verse 14, And God said unto Moses, Say, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am has sent me unto you. The phrase, I am that I am, means God is the God who has no equal 
This was quite a statement for Egypt, which was filled with the sundry of gods. But God says, I am that I am. I have no equal. There is none like me. Furthermore, this phrase, I am that I am, is connected to the name Yahweh, which was not a new name to Moses. The name Yahweh is used 160 times in the book of Genesis. But God told Moses his name was I am that I am because there was never a time when God did not exist. There will never be a time when God will cease to exist. The name I am even has within it the connotation that God is completely independent. He relies on nothing for his existence or for his life. And it's also connected with the idea of one that is eternal and unchanging and inherent in the words I am is the sense that God is the becoming one, which means God becomes whatever we lack in our time of need. This name I am means we can just fill in the blank. God is the one who is becoming what we need. God will be what you need him to be to you even today. But you have to remember that Moses was from a family that regularly used the name Tut Moses. Thoth was an Egyptian god they believed was self-created, self-sustaining, self-existing. And when Moses encountered God and God said, I am that I am, it was nearly the equivalent of saying, forget that God you grew up under. If you want to know the one who is self-existent and self-sustaining, it's me. I'm the real I am that I am. God's name was an announcement and God's name was a declaration. And in verse 15, God said moreover unto Moses, Thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, hath sent me unto you. This is my name forever. This is my memorial unto all generations. Verse 16, Go gather the elders of Israel together and say unto them, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, and of Isaac, and of Jacob, appeared unto me, saying, I have surely visited you and seen what is done to you in Egypt. That's amazing because they never saw him when he made his visit, but God had walked among them. And likewise, God knows exactly what's going on with you. And in verse 17, God said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt unto the land of the Canaanites and Hittites and Amorites and Perizzites and Hivites and the Jebusites unto a land flowing with milk and honey. And now we come to verse 18. And they shall hearken to thy voice and thou shalt come thou and the elders of Israel unto the king of Egypt and shall say unto him, The Lord God of the Hebrews has met with us and now let us go, we beseech you, three days into the wilderness that we may sacrifice unto the Lord our God. And in verse 9, God says, I am sure the king of Egypt will not let you go, not no, not by a mighty hand. The Hebrew says, except by a mighty hand. God knew the Pharaoh would not let this free labor force easily go. And God said, the king of Egypt will not let you go except by a mighty hand. And that is why in verse 20, God adds, and I will stretch out my hand and will smite Egypt with all of my wonders. Well, you have to remember that for decades and decades, possibly even for several hundred years, the people of Israel, the Hebrews in Egypt, they have been beaten with rods in Egypt. Egypt has held the rod out over the Hebrews and has beaten them into submission, beaten them into service, beaten them. They've worked for free. They've not been paid. They've been beaten and beaten and beaten. And now God says, now it's time for me to stretch out my hand over Egypt. I'm going to smite Egypt with all of my wonders, which I do in the midst thereof. And after that, Pharaoh will let you go. We're out of time. This is where we're going to pick up tomorrow, but I'll be back in just a moment. And I want to pray for you. The story of Moses and the Ten Plagues is one of the most exciting stories in the Bible. But in this new 10-part series by Rick Renner, you'll hear this story like you've never heard it before. In this series, Rick Renner takes us into the world of ancient Egypt, pyramids, tombs, and treasure cities, and explains that God's people there were blessed until a specific moment in time. In this fast-moving series, you'll learn that God has a plan for your deliverance too. 
This 10-part series is available in digital or physical format starting at just $20. In addition, we're offering you the books How to Keep Your Head On Straight in a World Gone Crazy for $20 and Last Day's Survival Guide for $25. There is so much information in the New Testament about end-time events, and Scripture tells us how to live victoriously in Christ in these times. Don't miss this special offer, this series, Moses and the Ten Plagues, and the books How to Keep Your Head On Straight in a World Gone Crazy and Last Day's Survival Guide. Call the number on your screen now or go to renner.org to order. Call or go online now. Hey friend, this is Rick Renner. We have a need in our ministry and I need you to help meet the need. So please just for a moment, hear my heart. Our ministry is really growing. Wow, it is amazing what is taking place. People are reaching out to us from every nook and cranny around the world because they're receiving teaching that they feel they can trust. And they're calling us for prayer. Wow, what a responsibility to pray for people. They're calling us for resources. They're calling us for support. They are reaching out to us in multiple languages, in English and Russian, and in other languages from around the world. And God has given us the responsibility to minister to these precious souls. But we're growing so much that we have run out of space. We're bursting at the seams in our American office and we need a new building. And we have found the building that we believe is ours. And guess what? It's fully furnished. All we have to do is move in. And so I'm asking you to please pray about becoming a part of the giving team into this special expansion project. Just go online, you'll read there on our homepage how you can participate in this project or give us a call. We have seen today that God works through human beings. He could have delivered Egypt by himself, but God chose Moses. And the Apostle Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1, that we are co-laborers together with God. God has chosen to do his work through people. God wants to work through you. God wants to use you to bring deliverance to your family, to your friends, to people that you know. And God will use you if you will surrender. God wants his power and his anointing to operate through you. Just like Moses had an experience on Mount Horeb, God wants to give you an experience that will transform you and empower you to do what he has asked you to do. And God says, certainly I will be with you. That is his promise to anyone that he gives an assignment to. Amen. But hey, today I'm offering you my series called Moses and the Ten Plagues. Please order this. It comes in multiple formats. It is just jam-packed with teaching. I love this series. And it comes with a study guide. The two of these together are so powerful. We're also offering you right now my book, which is called How to Keep Your Head on Straight in a World Gone Crazy, and my book, Last Day's Survival Guide. Wow, these books are just powerful. You can order all of these things by going online or give us a call right now. And when you call, be sure to let us know how to pray for you. And I want to pray for you right now. Father, you've given to every one of us an assignment and you want to use each one of us. Help us, Lord, to surrender to your call. We thank you for your power. We thank you for your anointing and that you guarantee certainly you will be with us on any assignment you give us. In Jesus' name, amen. I'll see you tomorrow. But remember Ecclesiastes 8.4, where the word of a king is, there is power.